Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Practicing Effective Management During Uncertain Times, hosted by TBD Solutions. My name is Remy Romanowski, and I will be moderating our discussion. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Attendees have all been muted to avoid background noise. A copy of today's slide will be made available to those who registered for the training. We hope to make a recording of today's webinar available as well. Today's webinar will be one hour long. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sarah Bowman and Travis Atkinson. Sarah Bowman has infused the private and public behavioral health system with positive energy and commitment to excellence for nearly 20 years. Her strong leadership, utilization of data-driven decision-making, and focus on outcome measures has helped her to build and transform numerous behavioral health programs and services. Sarah is a dynamic presenter and trainer and a co-creator of TBD Solutions, practicing effective management training. Sarah has an excellent track record for building high-performing, strength-based teams. For the past 15 years, Travis Atkinson has worked in both clinical and managerial roles in behavioral health. Through these experiences, he espouses the value of a healthy and functioning behavioral health care system the power of data to drive decision-making, and the importance of asking the right questions. Travis is proud to have trained hundreds of managers in effective management practices since co-creating the Practicing Effective Management Training. I will now turn it over to Travis. Thank you so much, Remy. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon to some and good morning to others. Have you ever wondered where digital photography came from. Maybe you recently, uh, prior to COVID, had a, a, a shoot at your company where you were getting headshots and updates to uh, your organization's website. Or have you ever wondered how did the internet and, and network connections become so reliable? Um, those are actually innovations that have happened within militaries, either within the United States or other militaries, not in business. And the same can be said about performance evaluations. So performance evaluations originated about 100 years ago in the military, and they were used both to tell people, uh, to tell soldier, uh, leaders and, and lieutenants and generals who was ready for a promotion. And in times of war, that is a very important piece of information to know because you might have to replace uh, a troop leader very quickly. And it was also used to say who is not really being helpful in our organization, in our in our military, and who do we need to keep an eye out for because they might become a liability. So when you sit down the next time to do performance evaluations, maybe that's in December or whenever your staff have their annual reviews done, uh, know that it, that was not a business uh, made invention, but it was actually created for a purpose to prepare uh, the military and to prepare teams in uh, uh, going to battle and being successful. I bring that up because sometimes stressful situations allow us to learn things and develop things that we would not have otherwise done if we didn't absolutely need them. And so in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about what do you really need to be an effective manager right now during this pandemic, but during uncertain times? So, so we're going to talk about three main areas. The first is we're going to set the table about what it means to be an effective manager and what were the best practices prior to the pandemic? And then how do we adapt some of those best practices into what we're doing right now? How do we stay nimble and effective when for some of us our entire world has changed and lastly we will be sharing several success stories of ways that leaders managers and organizations have adapted to make their workplaces effective but also to promote and reinforce connection between their staff To that point, we want to start with one of the foundational concepts um, that we believe uh, crosses all parts of management positions and responsibilities. A manager's job is all about the two R's, relationships and results. 
to foster healthy relationships with your staff and to achieve high quality results for your organization. It is critical that managers engage in, well, we try to narrow it down to a handful um, for our, our high priority list. And the first of that is the most important is getting to know your people. Um, relationships, that first R, is so critical. And, and I don't just mean you know their name, you know what department they work in, and you know if they're typically caught up on their paperwork or not. I mean, you really know who they are, you understand their strengths, their hopes, their dreams, their struggles, um, and that you have um, time that is prioritized, just devoted to getting to know them. And Travis is gonna elaborate that on that in a moment. We also believe that feedback, although often avoided, um, is a critical part of a manager's job. It's not always fun. Um, negative feedback can be kind of hard and leads some managers to avoid this, but providing positive and negative feedback to your staff will only help them to grow and become the best professional that they can be. We also recommend that managers uh, really sharpen up their skill set related to delegation and assuring that um, everyone has uh, the an adequate amount or the appropriate amount of tasks assigned and that you as the manager just don't take all of the spillover and think that you're the only one that can get it done, um, but that you look for ways to spread that work out equitably on your team. And it's an undertaught skill set that can be gained. And finally, um, respecting other folks' time um, is an important piece uh, and that, that goes into looking at how you manage your schedule, how you support your staff being able to manage their schedules, how you run meetings, um, but really valuing their time um, sends a great message of honor and respect. And it also helps you get results in, in the organization by being an efficient manager of time. And I see that I did skip number four there, foster growth. We're not gonna spend time talking about growth in the way that we normally do today, um, but surprisingly, you know, crisis is always an opportunity. So you're going to hear some examples where staff at various organizations have been given opportunities to grow and expand their skill set, um, even though it maybe isn't in the, the typical way that, that we would work on in a management process. So management during a pandemic is much the same as those core uh, critical skills we just talked about. And we recognize that each of you as a manager right now, likely on like one of two paths. So one pathway or journey um, might be that the majority of your team is now working from home, or maybe all or part of your team is laid off. And those that are working from home are likely doing tasks that they're maybe not used to doing, or they're having to do tasks in a different way. But the other path or journey you may be on as a manager is overseeing those essential workers that are still working every day and night in the office or in the community. And likely they're facing new stressors and new challenges every single day as this pandemic unfolds. Um, we do suggest that your approach is the same, that you build off of those core skills, but that you have an uh, a heightened intensity um, specific to relationships with your staff. So first and foremost, listen to your staff and provide validation for their thoughts and feelings. Um, this is your number one priority as a manager right now. This pandemic has impacted all of us. Yes, we're all struggling with many of the same things, uh, but please take the time to check in with your staff and learn about their individual journey right now. This is likely the first time that they've had to perform their job duties, support folks in crises, while they themselves and or their family members and loved ones are dealing with the same crises and the same fears and challenges. So this is a unique life and work situation for everyone. Um, if you only have the ability to focus on that, that is where we would start. But also please, um, use your skills to make sure that you are equipping your staff for success so that they are set up to be able to do the jobs you're asking them to do. They have the right materials, the right training, uh, the right mentoring if needed, and that you are assuring accountability. Um, typically, we think of micromanaging as kind of a negative thing, and most folks don't want to be micromanaged, myself included. 
However, in this time when sometimes entire teams have overnight really been deployed to working remotely and having to provide services and supports in a, in a new way to them, I would encourage you to not even think about the word micromanagement. You are going to be checking in with them regularly to make sure that um, you can support if they're facing any challenges, to make sure they understand what your expectations are, um, to make sure that they're meeting deadlines. Like when you're not working in the same physical location as your staff, um, it just makes sense. And the research shows that you need to have more frequent check-ins, more frequent monitoring. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. And as you talked about all of those um, those areas, it sounds like you know everything's dialed up a notch. That there's still going to be learning and growth that happens. There's going to be opportunities for feedback, but there might be less pleasantries. Uh, depending on where you live, maybe feedback is a really hard thing to give. Um, maybe um, the the way that you interact with people has had other. Um, Limit, limiting factors, um, but the the stakes are raised in this instance. And so I want to just go through quickly a communication hierarchy so that we think about how we're communicating with people. Now, normally the, the most effective way to, to uh, communicate with people is to meet in person. And for some of you, you might not have that option if you're managing a, rem a remote workforce, but you might have the chance to meet virtually. And I would say that that's the next best thing. Whenever you can have a, an interaction that, that involves human components to it, even if it's not sharing the same physical space, um, that you would go in that direction. And as you go down this communication hierarchy uh, between talking on the phone, um, using you know, a chat function, maybe through um, um, one of the one of the platforms that you have within your organization, um, using email and then using text. We really recommend the communication that happens more on the left side of this continuum. The communication that is more personal, more direct whenever you can do it. Now you might be at a crunch for time and some managers are. I'm used to talking to a lot of people that work in the crisis world and uh, every minute feels like it counts. Um, but other people's experiences might be that you actually have more time on your hands or their stat, your staff have more time than you did before. Um, either way, we really encourage you to take the most direct forms of communication if the questions that you ask have considerable consequences. Um, just think about email and text for a second. Email might be something that your organization uses regularly, and it's an expectation that people have their email open at least during business hours, but maybe any waking part of the day. Um, and for text messaging, you might uh, be using a work phone, but you also might get work uh, text messages from on your personal phone. But either of those two forms of communication are not as reliable as some of the others um, because some people might not have the access to those in, in a moment, or they might need a break. They might be taking a walk. Um, and so consider the way that you're communicating with your, your staff, the people that you supervise, uh, because um, it's, uh, it has to be clear in how you're communicating, not just what you're communicating. So the first step we're going to talk about, so as, as Remy mentioned in our introduction, uh, Sarah and I lead a practicing effective management training, which we have done since 2016. And this training focuses on all the aspects of how to be an effective manager. And this is the toolbox that we've come up with. Uh, there's a number of pieces on here that we don't unfortunately have time to get to within uh, the hour, but we're going to focus on some of the, the areas that have the blue boxes around it. And the first one is knowing your people, the importance of one on ones and spending time getting to know your, those staff that you have. Um, one of the most uh, famous minds in management and leadership is Peter Drucker. And Peter has this quote, which I think is tremendous. It says, the purpose of an organization is to enable ordinary human beings to do extraordinary things. It is a means to make strengths productive and weaknesses irrelevant. So when I read this from Drucker, it makes me think that business or organizations are intended to bring out the best in people not to make everybody perfect and great at all of the same things, but to play on the strengths or the skills of everyone in their own unique ways to be something together that we are much greater than if we were apart. 
And so one-on-ones are this intentional supervision method for fostering strong and healthy relationships with those staff. And we're gonna break down what that looks like and how you can do that with your team if it's not something that you do already. The first is that they're scheduled weekly, okay? Um, if you use your calendar with regularity and you're able to stick to it, then people can tell what your values are based on what your calendar looks like and what you spend your time doing. So just like you would schedule important meetings on your calendar with your boss, you put these on your calendar with the people that you supervise so that they're consistent and reliable and dependent. The second is that they are with every direct report, not just the ones that you like. Every staff member that you interact with, that, that you supervise directly, you would be having these meetings with. They would last for 30 minutes. Uh, we choose 30 minutes because there is uh, thousands of, um, of people who have gone through this effort to say, what is the sweet spot? And 30 minutes is determined to be the, the right amount to get the information across um, that still allows people to feel like they're connected and is an efficient use of time. Another important point is that the staff are talking first in these meetings. Um, the, the general dynamic within a supervisory relationship is that um, managers are always the ones to communicate with staff and when they do, it's either neutral information or it might even be a negative interaction. So kind of that ooh kind of experience when somebody gets called down to the principal's office or um, somebody gets asked to go into a, a supervisor's office, something like that. But in this meeting, the staff are allowed to initiate the meeting and bring things up first. And the last point is that the manager takes notes. You write down things that you care about. So you wouldn't come into this meeting just with a, a cup of coffee to just say, oh, so what are we talking about today? but that there are likely action items that come out for either person in this meeting, but it's imperative that the manager is taking notes. And Travis, I wanna just jump in real quickly and highlight for folks, because I'm guessing there are a few of you when Travis mentioned that one-on-ones happen weekly with each of your staff members for 30 minutes, you quickly started to count up staff, do math and say, this guy uh, doesn't have any clue how large my team is and that's not possible. Um, so although we can't, we'd love to talk with you about that. Give us a call. We'll set up a coffee date. Um, I just wanted to explain that this model of one-on-ones is backed by decades of research by our friends at Manager Tools. There's um, books written about it. There's research articles. There's free uh, podcasts where you can learn about the research that went into crafting this recipe for what makes effective one-on-ones. And it is normal to have that reaction to think, there's no way I can do that in my schedule. And we do have some tips and tricks for you to, to actually change your thinking around that uh, to realize this is um, one of the most critical things you could do as a manager. And yes, there are ways to make that happen, even with large teams in the double digits. But for today, we'll have to put that in the parking lot. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Sarah. Uh, and I, I will just uh, expound on that briefly that it is very important right now during this pandemic that you know what your staff are doing and how you can be helpful with them. Um, any staff that you've kept on, maybe some of your organizations have had to make cuts. Um, it only reinforces the importance and the value of your employees. And so, so your accountability to their behavior or their workplace performance is high. And if you don't know what they're doing, if you're not making the time to talk with them, then that you're, you're suspect to your plans or your objectives going off course um, because you didn't take the time to be intentional on the front end. So thanks for bringing that up, Sarah. So this is the format of a one-on-one -on -one meeting that's 30 minutes long. In, in, a, in, a, in a normal world, we would have 10 minutes for the, the staff or the direct, we'll call them, to talk, 10 minutes for you to talk as the supervisor, and then the last 10 minutes are spent talking about the future. What does the next week look like? How are you doing on your performance evaluation goals? You know, what do we need to think about in the coming months as we as we look at strategy for our organization or, or metrics, things like that. Um, if you are engaging these meetings for the first time, you might find that your staff talk for the entire 30 minutes. And if they do, that's OK. Remember that you might be trying to help your staff unlearn or or change their uh, perspective on the people that supervise them. 
bosses don't usually have a good reputation. Uh, when you say the word boss, you might think of some kind of character from a, a sitcom or something that's just really out of touch and, and inefficient and effective. Uh, so, you, so give your staff time to talk and build trust and eventually you'll get to what you need to. And if you don't get to it in that meeting, you still have all the same channels that you used to communicate with people before and eventually you'll find some balance. Now in uncertain times, you might have to just eliminate the 10 minutes to talk about the future and move it to a 15 and 15 um, level in these meetings. And honestly, it could be less. If your staff is leading the meeting and they, they give you their three points of things that they're working on and they've got a busy day and you have a busy day and you get across what you're able to, well, then you might get a get out of jail free card by having a 10 or 15 minute meeting instead of a 30 minute meeting. So plan for 30, but if it if it ends early, that's just bonus time for both of you to work on whatever it is that that you've planned to do with the rest of your day. Talking or sending a message and listening, receiving a message are two important but very different parts of the communication process. I'm sure you all remember that from undergrad communication course, um, but most humans really struggle with listening. And I love this quote by Fran Leibowitz, the opposite of listening isn't talking, it's waiting to talk. Because how often do we do that as managers, right? We've got this to-do list running in our head. We already maybe see 10 steps ahead of what our direct report is coming to us with or the question they have. And so we're having this dialogue in our head and we're not truly present with them. Now, I know many of you on the phone are from the behavioral health world. And so although this is a skill set that you've probably honed over years in your clinical work, sometimes we forget that we need to use that same active listening skill set as a supervisor. And it can be a, a dangerous trap to fall into to be too task focused or you know outcome focused and not truly be present with your folks and engage in the active listening that you would in um, some type of, you know, a therapeutic counseling session or something. Um, and I want to call out a great article that Harvard Business Review recently posted. Um, Peter Bregman wrote this article, Empathy Starts with Curiosity. And his main encouragement to managers during this time of the pandemic is simply to slow down and take the time to ask people to tell you more. One of my favorite professors in college, Dr. Beckler, I can still see him at the front of the class saying, oh, tell me more about that. Like it was his go-to line, but it really is a great way to force yourself to slow down and, and listen to your staff. Being in this quarantine, being in shelter at home, having our workplaces kind of turned upside down for those that are still there and those that are working from home can bring up lots of unsettling feelings. And many Americans, it's kind of our cultural, common cultural response when we have difficult or unsettling feelings, we scramble, right? We move, we do things, we fix things. But as you know from those of you that are from the behavioral health side, um, sometimes the, the great beauty and the great gift that we can give someone is just by sitting with them and asking about their feelings and their thoughts and listening. And I would definitely encourage you during these uncertain times to, to focus on the use of that skill set when you interact with each and every one of your staff. Another article um, that Harvard Business Review uh, published recently, uh, that one is called To Take Care of Others, Start by Taking Care of Yourself by Johnson and Humble. Um, they introduced the concept that all of us can be first responders for emotional support during these unprecedented times. Um, so, you know, bottom line, you as a manager, you are a first responder for emotional support for your team. So please make yourself available to your team. And one quick plug I'll put in for Harvard Business Review. Uh, it's a source that Sarah and I get a lot of information from for managers. Um, they have a, a lot of free content and you can also subscribe um, for some uh, a small nominal fee to some paid efforts. But um, it's it's as Sarah said, we have many behavioral health care professionals on the phone uh, on the call or the webinar today, I should say, and it's OK to 
to glean some of your practices from the for-profit world or from the business world. Uh, there's a lot of sound principles that come out of some of these articles and in an article like Empathy Starts with Curiosity, you can certainly see the overlap between uh, the, the, the business world and the healthcare world. So, uh, Sarah, are you taking this slide? Oh, I don't even want to say the words. <laughs> you're going to you're going to make me put money in the oh, I was on mute jar, which is a, <laughs> which is a fun challenge that somebody might get rich off of during these times of <laughs> webinars and and teleconferencing meetings. But one of the things we are recommending that all folks do um, during these uncertain times and thankfully things are starting to I mean, knock on wood, things are starting to even out a little bit and although we know that this new reality we'll have to deal with for months and months to come, but it's not hopefully it's not quite as um, painful maybe or alarming as it was in those very first few days and weeks as a manager, but we hope that you've already started. Um, and if you have, we hope that you continue to provide daily standing meetings to your team. Um, this is true for both your teams that are now suddenly remote teams and working from home and your teams that are the critical infrastructure workers um, dealing with um, the most critical needs in the office or in the community or in hospital settings. And we want you to keep these meetings very short. Uh, these meetings are more about relationship than they are results. We'll talk about result meetings a little bit later, but these meetings are really just to take the temperature of your team each morning, right? Like to take your team vital signs, use video. There's power in eye contact. There's power in being able to see each other's faces. Um, it really will be more of a connection for you and your team if you can see each other and take time um, during these very brief, again, no more than 15 minutes um, with your entire team to connect, whether that's really asking people, hey, how's life in, in, in your world this morning or how was your morning? Maybe it's using humor to do kind of a fun icebreaker to bring some positivity in for folks. As a manager, um, it can be real helpful to ask your staff, what are your priorities today? What's your biggest thing you want to get accomplished? Is there anything I can do to help you with that? Is there anything you need assistance with? And although you might feel like really in the time of you know, 50 new regulations every day that I have to read and figure out how to implement with policy and procedure. I've got to add another meeting with my staff. Yes, it will save you time in the long run and it will um, for both of your groups of staff, those that are still working in the office and those that have been displaced or working remotely, it will give them a sense of connection with each other and with you. And honestly, those relationships are going to be what get folks through through these stressful times. We also recommend the other way when we say your team, it's typically the folks you're managing, but each of you as managers belong to a team, your fellow managers, your fellow executives or administrators. And we know many of the organizations that we work with throughout the state have had, you know, daily executive level meetings or management level meetings so that all managers have the right information, are up to speed. Uh, know what information needs to be sent out to staff. So it kind of goes both ways, having that regular daily check in with the folks you manage as a team, but also checking in with your team that you're a part of. So we're next going to talk about delegation and this importance of pushing work down. And this has really changed right now uh, during the pandemic and, and it's and everything that has come as a result of it. Traditional delegation is very well thought out. Um, it's usually not done on a whim, but it's it's something that is intentional where you take time and say, this is a task that I'd like you to take on. Here's why I think you would be good at it. Here are all the steps. Let's review those. Did you have a chance? And what questions do you have for me? So in that uh, dynamic, it's it's very easy to understand and you're able to, with confidence, pass things along to people. Now, during COVID-19 response, uh, delegation probably looks a little bit more like this. Uh, people's worlds are um, overlapping in ways that they didn't before. Let's say that your office, um, uh, you know, had to uh, 
lay, lay off or, or cut back on some of your workers and now you are the one that is sweeping the floors at, at the end of the day or you need to find somebody else in your organization to do that. Um, delegation in this time really requires a nimble workforce that is willing to say yes. And I know that many of my innovative colleagues and, and, and friends uh, who are doing great work at their organizations, they are they are made up of people who are always trying to be willing to say yes and find solutions to the, the, the problems that they're dealing with. So some staff have to get repurposed or, or sent out in different places. So I know of some programs, for example, that have been temporarily closed and they've taken the staff from there and they've and they've repurposed them into maybe a helpline at their organization uh, or a way to support the other staff. They're jumping into jobs that they've never had before. That little line at the end of your job description that says um, all other job duty, duties as assigned, that's probably being used a lot right now. And as a manager, you shouldn't abuse it, but everyone needs to recognize that we're all going to be doing something different than we typically do. Yeah, Travis, that that really hit the, the main points. I just want to add that sometimes as managers, um, especially in the healthcare world, and I've observed this a lot in behavioral health worlds, we, out of a desire to help and support our staff and at times protect them because we may see that they're overloaded or have lots of stress or, or duties, we might not delegate as much as we could. Um, and again, we don't have time to get into all of the strategies to uh, combat that if you do kind of fall into that martyr land sometimes. Often we fall into that place with good intent, but it really does harm not only our own, our own performance, but also the performance and learning of our teams if we're not willing to delegate in the traditional sense of just passing tasks off, but also in these times where we have to be creative, we have to think outside of the box, and we have to really re- shuffle everything to make sure that the staff that are still working have adequate work, have enough work to keep them busy and that there's kind of an equ uh, equity of workload among everyone on our teams or among various teams. I want to highlight a few local Michigan successes where organizations have responded to COVID with some great um, delegation strategies of, of uh, dispersing that work and repurposing operations. So at West Michigan Community Mental Health, they're using a job jar, which is a list of activities that are pending uh, or have been on hold or just plain are those things that they never have time to get to. And they're using that list of, of activities and work to purposefully assign work and responsibilities to staff that aren't really at capacity right now due to their job shifting because of COVID. And they have two staff assigned to monitor all of the job jar activities, to coordinate things, communicate, and, and just make sure that that's an evolving ongoing work effort. And they've had great success with that. Um, another example would be uh, Community Mental Health for Central Michigan. They have worked with their local emergency department. I'm sure many providers throughout the country have done similar efforts, but they're providing iPads so that the telehealth crisis interventions and pre-screens, I'm sorry, that those can be occurring via telehealth and not need a face-to-face -face contact. Um, what's cool about that type of an example where maybe you're deploying technology uh, that you haven't before or uh, another similar technology um, uh, example is if you haven't been using a behavioral health app that the individuals you serve can self-report on symptoms and be linked with services like my strength is a commonly used one that might be something your organization can roll out now uh, west michigan cmh that was one of the things they bumped up on their list they said we haven't had time to tackle this and now's the perfect time to tackle it but both of those examples show where Typically, a supervisor or a director would probably handle that rollout of a new telehealth service line or a new application. But in this time, let's give that opportunity to some of your, your lead staff. Let's help them learn how to manage a project of deploying an app. And that's exactly what West Michigan has done. Or let's ask one of your lead staff to oversee the, the communication and rollout of that equipment at, at the emergency department. That's gonna challenge your staff. That's gonna get them excited about having that amount of responsibility. So we encourage you to look for those opportunities. Other opportunities of repurposing operations, West Michigan CMH is 
creating activity packets um, for adult consumers who live alone or are isolated, uh, may, for kids and families, and they have different types of activity bags for different skill levels and independence. And they're focused on helping folks stay active, um, making healthy choices during this time. And so normally they would not have capacity to create and dis, uh, distribute those things, but they're able to, to repurpose their operations and make that happen. When you, um, on the next slide, Travis, when you as a manager decide to delegate or repurpose some of these tasks and assign them to new folks, we encourage you to be aware of the stages of competence model. And basically, it's really easy to grasp this model if you think about riding a bike, right? Riding a bike fairly quickly becomes unconscious competence, which is the bottom line on the chart. You do it without thinking. Uh, once you've learned how to do it, you can pedal, you can steer, you can wave at someone, maybe you pop a wheelie. You do all these things without really processing them. But typically it takes time to get there, right? And there is a time when you're learning to ride a bike that you have to go through these other stages of unconscious incompetence. Oh, I didn't even know I had to, you know, hold the steering wheel in that way or the bike would spike and I'd fall off. Or conscious incompetence. I know I'm not steering very straight. I know I'm really wobbly and I'm working on that. Um, etc. I'm not going to go through all of these, but take a take a chance to read through these and think about when you are assigning a new task to a staff, what stage are they at? And if they're for that task, if they're already at unconscious competence, they can easily perform the skill. It's like second nature to them. You can probably just toss it to them and they're going to run with it and be successful. But if they are anywhere else on this continuum, make sure that you're matching your uh, delegation method or your supervision method, your um, monitoring of what they're doing, your support of them with the appropriate interventions. Because if you just throw it to them and they're in one of the, the lower levels of competence, the outcomes are not going to be so great. And that's sometimes where we fall into that trap of thinking, see, that's why I don't delegate. That's why I don't have other people do things. It's just more work. Well, that's true if you as the manager don't match the appropriate delegation method with their stage of competence. So we are next going to talk about uh, effective meeting facilitation, and this takes on uh, an additional component of, 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 of a challenging nature when you are not in the same room and there are so many other factors that you can't control. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen um, my uh, colleagues or customers children in the last few weeks and it's wonderful and everybody is very grace filled and they've seen mine. I've put a lot of Barbie clothes on um, on Barbies while I've been doing conference calls. Um, uh, but Sarah, would you like to talk through the effect of virtual meetings or would you like me to do this? Yeah, I can chat about it. Uh, feel free to jump in if I miss anything. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the check in meetings with your entire teams in the morning are really about relationships. But work has to go on, right? Normal deliverables must be met even in these times. So for your more task oriented meetings that maybe in the past would have been face to face, often now are all required to be virtual. So here's a few quick tips for you. Um, always build time in to start with water cooler moments. Those things that would naturally happen in the workplace as you're walking down the hall when people get into the meeting room a few minutes early, we still desperately need that kind of transition time and that connection with others. And me being pretty task oriented, I have to force myself to slow down and chat with folks in the beginning of a meeting because I'm just like chomping ready to start on that agenda. So don't fall into that trap. Build in those brief water cooler moments at the beginning of your meetings. We do encourage you to use cameras so you can have that face to face connection. But keep in mind, if you're all looking at the same document, it will be much less stressful for you if you just screen share the document turn off the cameras for a few minutes and all look at the document rather than each other's faces looking at the document on a separate screen. Um, so use screen sharing uh, within your meetings as needed. Also give your eyes a break. 
So don't feel that you have to stare at the camera if, if it is a time that you have all your cameras on. Um, don't feel that you just have to stare at each other nonstop. We've all been seeing the Facebook posts about Zoom fatigue and all of that. Um, give your eyes a, few, a break. No one's going to think badly of you if you look away for a few moments. Um, and please, please, please uh, prevent yourself from multitasking. We know that this is a temptation um, at all times with technology, but please set yourself up to be successful to not be multitasking. And I'll, I'll end with this last tip about embracing silence. Um, the research about decision making, because remember, we often do meetings to make critical decisions. And the research around that shows that unstructured discussions in an attempt to reach consensus often fail, typically because some group members won't speak up, some group members speak up too much. People are less likely to share information that is not in line with um, like the prevailing sentiment of the group. So you don't get like equal floor space for all competing ideas. So use virtual meetings as an opportunity to embrace silence and it will actually improve the quality of decisions made in those meetings. And what I mean by that is do written brainstorming. So some apps, you actually can have a whiteboard on the screen in your platform, like a, it looks like a whiteboard and a marker. Um, or you could use some type of shared document, like a Google document or a Teams document, where as someone is typing in it, um, everyone sees. So you can have people submit via the chat or via a shared document that everyone has open, brainstormed ideas or information to inform a decision in writing versus verbally. And this will increase the likelihood that the quiet one that's not going to speak up on a video call, um, it will increase the likelihood that their information is heard and it will increase the likelihood that you have a diverse um, set of information. I, if you don't know how to use breakout rooms, for example, in Zoom, or you don't know how to use the whiteboard function in Teams or different things, please Google this. You can find YouTube videos on how to set up uh, the breakout rooms to even have mini meetings within a meeting. If you want to have three sets of your staff break out and have a discussion and then come back to the larger meeting, there's a lot that you can do that really does mimic what you could do in a physical room. Um, yeah, I think those, for the sake of time, I'll stop there. I could go on, but. <laughs> All right, so one thing I wanna share about effective time management. So everybody that's listening, go ahead, take your hands right now if they're not uh, doing something else and put them up like you're framing a, a film sequence, okay? Like like uh, making two sets of L's in opposite directions. So you've got you know, almost like you have the frame of your computer in between your fingers. The way that you want to think about your schedule is where your left hand thumb touches your right hand pointer finger in that frame, okay? And this goes for the time of day, the day of the week, or the or the time of the month that you are trying to, to set your priorities. The reason that we set priorities early on in the day or the week is because they matter and they might affect what we're, what we're being asked to do the rest of the week or what our priorities are. The other piece is if something more important somehow comes up, we can always move it to later in the day or later in the week. If you schedule your most important things on Thursdays and Fridays, and then something happens and something comes up, you just might not have time in the week to get to it. So use your time early in the day, early in the week, or if you have monthly deadlines, put them early in the month, so you have some cushion and then you can put the less important things later in the day or later in in the week. And Sarah is going to take this next slide. Yeah, your audio cut out a little bit there. It sounded like you were DJing with a record for a second. That was kind of fun. No, You're I spicing apologize. It up. Oh, <laughs> no, there's it's, probably it's a lot I, of Amazon. <laughs> I thought maybe we were going to wrap for the rest of the webinar. There um, might be a lot of Amazon tablets upstairs that are taking the bandwidth. I apologize. <laughs> Understandable. We all have grace during this time, right? Um, so in addition to repurposing operations, like I talked about a few moments ago, where you really switch up the whole deck with who's doing what to meet current needs, you also have a great opportunity right now to re excuse me, to reframe relationships. The incredible needs facing our communities today provides an opportunity to work with either new community partners 
or to identify creative uh, new ways of collaborating with existing partners. We encourage you to first pause, reflect on the purpose of your organization, really reconnect with who you are as an organization and why you do what you do. Then think creatively about how your organization or who your organization can partner with to meet the current needs of the community. For example, corporate leaders at Wendy's made the decision to redeploy $40 million that was sla uh, slated for advertising to launch new breakfast items. Um, that's just what we need, right? New hot food, uh, fast food breakfast items to better partner instead with their fran uh, franchises by extending the payment terms for brand royalties, deferring rent payments, and allowing uh, franchisees an additional year to complete required store renovations. So they knew they needed to step up and partner with those franchisees and offer some supports for them during this time. Um, Harvard Business Review, we already did a shout out to them, but all of their pandemic uh, response materials are free. Typically, there's a limit. You can only look at a certain number of articles per month. Right now, you can look at all of their pandemic articles with no limit. It's free to everyone. And I'm assuming that they're going to gain post pandemic. They're going to gain more than a few uh, customers and new followers because people will have been turned on to their product and realize how helpful um, their marketing literature is, or I'm sorry, their management literature and business literature is. And so they're going to have a new probably market share because of this um, decision they made. Many organizations are also sharing employees in cross industry talent exchanges. Um, so this can prevent layoffs in some instances, <clears throat> and it allows staff to develop new skills and networks. So back to that fostering growth, it's maybe not looking at it from the angle of, hey, where do you want to be in five years? But it's that angle of, um, for example, the staff I mentioned earlier, a staff that normally works full time in the jail is now leading the deployment of a behavioral health app for her organization. She's also now um, having an opportunity to write a grant response for the first time. That's helping her develop new skills and, and a new network of folks because she can't provide the direct services in the jail anymore. Um, a national example of this is Kroger, where they're temporarily uh, borrowing furloughed employees from Cisco Corporation. Another Michigan provider success in reframing relationships is Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. Um, they're just doing some amazing stuff with the homeless population. And they've partnered with a variety of other community partners like United Way, Manpower, uh, one of the local churches for use of their gymnasium, multiple homeless shelter providers already existing in the community. They're, they're working with those folks to provide a temporary day shelter and connections to services for individuals that are homeless. They found that because of COVID and the shelter in place, there was no no places for the folks to go during the day where they normally would be able to eat and go to the restroom and have shelter. So they have uh, opened that up and they've deployed staff from multiple teams, their adult services team, uh, to, to now work in that um, day shelter. And it's been an incredibly rewarding experience for them. So look for those, look for those opportunities to meet the needs in your community. Um, another thing that we wanted to touch on, and I'm not going to go into much time. I know that we have about 10 minutes left, but many of you are probably faced with the reality of managing a team, a remote team now for the first time, maybe a team that became remote within the matter of a few days, if not overnight. And there's a tremendous amount of research out there about the challenges and opportunities that managing a remote team or telecommuting staff, um, and so if you have not educated yourself in that area and now you're managing folks remotely, we encourage you to. But I'll just, gosh, there's so much I want to go on this. I guess I will only talk about two, the perceived control and boundary management, because I think this just really hits home for many folks right now. Um, there's the research shows that staff that have higher perceived control in telecommuting situations so they feel that they have more control in when they work where they work and how they work um, they're going to have jo higher job satisfaction and higher performance and we know that this is needed in this time right folks are homeschooling kids 
Um, they may have very young children that have to have naps and frequent feedings. So allowing your staff to have control over certain things and for them to recognize and perceive that they have control over parts of their schedule is critical. The boundary management piece speaks to the boundaries between home and work. And everyone has different preferences in that area, but the research does show that those folks working from home that have a stronger boundary in separating work and home tend to have higher satisfaction and higher performance. Again, this is an area I encourage you to actively discuss with your staff. Where are they working in their homes? What type of um, environmental structures do they have, if any, to balance the fact that they have children in the home or they have a spouse in the home? Do they want to be working in the kitchen and they're okay being interrupted throughout the day? Or is that something that is very stressful for them and so they need to come up with a different plan even if it's gosh working out of a closet or something so i encourage you to have those discussions and and figure out what works for your staff but also educate yourself as a manager about um, the nuances of managing a remote team um, if you want to know more about these other bullets that I didn't get into, please email me or, or give me a call and I'd be happy to even send you a list of articles to get started for your reading on managing telecommuting staff. So we're going to talk about some more effective management and action examples. Um, the first, this is the Instagram uh, feed for my friend uh, Laura Mayer, who is uh, director over crisis services at PRS Crisis Link in Virginia. And this was a picture that she posted of her new uh, home office space. So they have moved all of their crisis call center uh, entirely remotely. And one thing that uh, Laura mentioned is that they every day this the team has um, kind of like an open window, like a Zoom window for any staff that want to come in and just check in and say hi and talk to each other, have a space where they can decompress, kind of like what you would do if you had were at your office and you had um, a staff lounge or a kitchen or something like that. Um, another one is from Crisis Response Network and Crisis Response Network is in uh, Maricopa County, which is the largest county in Arizona where Phoenix is located. Um, Executive Director Justin Chase there has opened up office hours on a regular basis with his staff. Anybody that wants to do virtual office hours can drop into the Zoom meeting or the Teams meeting and just and talk and, and share what's on their mind. Um, both of these examples really highlight that managers might need to take on an additional role of preserving their staff's uh, well-being from a social perspective um, and providing other opportunities for people to connect. Which leads me to my last example, uh, which has actually happened within our organization, TBD Solutions. So. Um, uh, Remy, who uh, is our moderator today, ha had created some hybrids of our staff of what it would look like if we could maybe cut, create some efficiencies by just combining two people into one. And she created this one uh, and called us the training experts. This is uh, Savis, I believe is the name. So it's a mix of myself and Sarah. Um, and she made a number of these as part of a, um, a happy hour that we do every Friday for work. Um, where people can come and connect and unwind and and find some time to enjoy each other. Now, some some introverts might uh, like to uh, be alone and be out in the woods or, you know, not engage in every uh, happy hour experience at the end of the week, or maybe that's when you're the most exhausted. And that's fine, um, but it, there is kind of an impetus on employers to provide some opportunities for people co to connect if they so choose to do do that. And Travis, I just want to add to that. You're, you're absolutely right that managers of staff that are remote or telecommuting have to take extra measures to assure that those staff still feel connected with the organization culture, with the team culture, with relationships with their colleagues. And so some additional examples of successes of Michigan providers in this area, Central Michigan CMH is um, doing their own version of video and picture challenges. So they uh, actually, everyone that participates in the video challenge for submitting your favorite snack or activity during the stay at home time, um, or they had one where folks dressed up in formal wear, which I think sounds really fun. 
Um, they had one involved pictures of pets. Everyone that participates uh, gets entered in a drawing for a gift card, and then they share those videos at staff meetings just to help people laugh and kind of connect for a few moments. Um, Central Michigan is also doing, uh, managers are making sure that there are Zoom lunches and coffee breaks offered so folks can connect like they would at the office. They're doing a Zoom Pilates class. I might have to talk to some of my friends at Central and see if I can crash that class. Um, one more call out to Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. They're using some of their staff uh, that have specific skill sets like um, their health mentor is leading a health, like a workout video for staff. And then one of their dietitian and nutrition uh, care managers is doing a healthy cooking video from home. And staff are just really enjoying those times to connect with each other. Awesome. So we are right near the end of it. So uh, the last few things that we want to say, first of all, um, TBD Solutions, Sarah and I uh, provide this product practicing effective management training uh, to customers. As we said at the beginning, we've trained uh, hundreds of managers. Um, it's a two day training uh, focused on relationships and results that goes more in depth to the, what we've discussed here today. Uh, we also provide management and leadership consultation to managers, directors and um, uh, executives. Uh, we also offer strategic planning and program development services and uh, have done a lot of policy research in the workforce and behavioral health care arenas. You can learn more about all the services that we offer at tbdsolutions.com. So the last thing I want to say is that your um, existence might feel a lot like this picture on the left side, um, kind of just a, a maze of uncertainty and not, not sure where to go. And you're hoping to get over to that right side where the path is clear and you understand what's happening. Um, when you practice effective management techniques, you're going to learn things about yourself and about your teammates. I think one of the most beautiful things about what's happening right now is that we're seeing some of the best that people have to offer as humans, and that's really inspiring. And this will give indicators for what you uh, as an organization uh, can do in the future, and you might find strengths and opportunities that you didn't realize were there if, if this crisis hadn't come on. Um, so Sarah and I encourage you to, to continue to practice these principles, to be um, very attuned with your staff, to offer ways that you can help and bring you to that place where um, you have a, a, a good chance at connecting and being successful at whatever your organization's mission is. So the last thing I want to say, our contact information is up here as well as our social media handles. If you have questions, you can email info at tbdsolutions.com. And lastly, as, a, as an added bonus, we will be sending out a satisfaction uh, survey for today's webinar. We'd love your feedback and I apologize that we weren't able to have uh, a, a, a chat box today on the webinar, but if you fill out this, uh, this brief uh, response to the webinar, we will send you a resource uh, that has information. We call it something to watch, something to listen to, something to read that kind of includes many of our sources from this uh, webinar that we'd be glad to share with you. So on behalf of Sarah and myself, thank you so much for attending today's webinar, and we hope that you have a safe and meaningful rest of the week. Take care, everybody.